Okay, so we've seen how you can react an alcohol with a, a, a halogen acid in order to turn the OH into a good leaving group by making it into a neutral water molecule when it leaves. And the other half of that halogen acid is a good nucleophile. So if we use HCl or HBr or HI, then we have a Cl minus, a chloride, a bromide, or an iodide um, as the other half of the acid, which are good nucleophiles. So we can, we can react alcohols in an SN2 reaction uh, to convert them to alkyl halides, even though the OH is a bad leaving group, um, if we protonate the OH first, so we treat it with an acid. Um, so this reaction works, but there are some limitations of this method. So first of all, there are poor yields of alkyl chlorides from primary and secondary alcohols. So um, HBr and HI work pretty well. Bromide and iodide are very strong nucleophiles. And so those reactions work uh, pretty well to, to yield, to give us a high yield of the alkyl bromide or the alkyl iodide, but it doesn't work particularly well with alkyl chlorides. So using an acid or an alcohol with HCl is not a very good method for making an alkyl chloride from an alcohol. Um, another limitation is that just like with any substitution reaction, anytime we're talking about SN1 or SN2, we always have the possibility of an elimination occurring as well. Um, so depending on the degree of substitution on that substrate, um, we have an elimination reaction in competition with that substitution. So remember back from that chapter, um, the degree of substitution for E2, E1, and SN1 all follow the same scheme, the same trend, which is that the tertiary substrate reacts the fastest, secondary is slower, primary doesn't even occur in a unimolecular mechanism, so it doesn't even happen with SN1 or E1 because then we'd have to make a primary uh, a primary carbocation, which is too unstable. And so um, if depending on the degree of substitution on our alcohol, um, it's possible that w the elimination is not in competition with the substitution. So remember SN2 is the only mechanism that follows the trend that the methyl group is the fastest, the one with the least steric hindrance, and then primary, and then secondary, and tertiary, and so on. So if our uh, if our alcohol is primary, then it's almost certainly going to be an SN2 mechanism. If it's secondary, then we have competition between substitution and elimination. And if it's tertiary, it's almost certainly not going to be SN2. So we always have to remember the same rules that we used before for substitution and elimination. They still apply even though we're using an acid in, for alcohols instead of a base. Um, we get rearrangements, so any this is true anytime we have a carbocation, we can always have rearrangements, and those often catch us off guard, and we're not expecting the rearrangement to occur, and so when we're trying to predict the product, we will get a different product than we were expecting. Um, and so it's uh, anytime we can avoid making the carbocation, if there's a better way to do it that avoids that carbocation, then those are usually a better reaction. And finally, um, we have a limited ability to make alkyl iodides with HI depending on the nature of the substrate um, just because uh, although iodide is a very good nucleophile um, depending on the degree of substitution on our substrate we might get uh, some other reactions occurring as well. Iodine has a, a potential to, um, to oxidize and so sometimes we get react uh, side products that we're not expecting when we use iodine. So these reactions are possible. We've gone over these mechanisms before. We've seen how this works, but sometimes there's a better way for us to get an alkyl halide from an alcohol, and that's what we're going to look at next. So uh, to get an alkyl chloride, we could use an alcohol in HCl, but remember that that reaction doesn't work particularly well. So if we, instead of using HCl, if we use a phosphorus halide, um, we generally get better yields. So PCl3 or PCl5, these are good reagents to use when we're looking to turn an alcohol into an alkyl chloride. 
if we're looking to turn an alcohol into an alkyl bromide, then we can use uh, phosphorus bromide, PBr3. Um, and you notice that there's a, a bit of a difference in the stoichiometry here. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, there are every, every phosphorus halide bond in these reagents is um, going to be reactive. So for PCl3, we have three reactive PCl bonds. And so that means that each of those bonds can potentially react with an alcohol and create an alkyl chloride. Notice that we, in the stoichiometry, we have three alcohols for every one molecule or one mole of PCl3. And that will yield three alkyl chlorides and one molecule of uh, the, the phosphorus that's bonded to three hydroxyl groups. The same is true with the bromide. PBr3 has three reactive PBr bonds, and so we can react three alcohols with PBr3 to make three alkyl bromides. Um, and PCl5 reacts a little bit differently. So PCl5 is going to just make, there's a one-to-one -one ratio here, and our byproducts are a little different. Some of those chlorides stay attached to the phosphorus. Um, and finally, when we're trying to use this strategy to make iodides, alkyl iodides, um, we can't, there is no react, reagent PI3 that's stable enough for us to store in a bottle. So those three reactions on top, PCL3, PBR3, PCL5, those reagents are all stable enough that we can store them in a bottle and add them to our alcohol when we're ready to do the reaction. However, uh, PI3 is not particularly stable. It decomposes into phosphorus and iodine. There's this equilibrium occurring. We see that down there. Um, two phosphorus plus three molecules of iodine is in equilibrium with two molecules of PI3, the phosphorus triiodide. Uh, and so we have to make this in situ. And we've seen this before. We saw this earlier in this chapter when we were uh, working with chromic acid, which is that chromic acid is also not stable. Uh, that, right, it looks like sulfuric acid, but it has a chromium instead. So we can't actually react, uh, keep chromic acid in a bottle either. It's unstable. And so we have to make that chromic acid in situ, which just means we put in the components that create chromic acid when we're ready to use it. And then it, it's made fresh inside the reaction, and then we can add our alcohol, and we can uh, move forward with the reaction. So we've seen this kind of uh, strategy before, where if we want PI3, we can't just open up a bottle and put PI3 into our reaction. We have to put phosphorus and iodine. And phosphorus and iodine will react inside the reaction vessel to create some small amount of PI3, which will then react with our alcohol and drive the reaction forward to make our alkyl iodide. So the, in summary here, we can use these phosphorus halides the same way that we would use halogen acids. HCl, HBr, and HI can yield our, our alkyl halides, and PCl3, PBr3, PI3, and also PCl5, these are all alternatives to those hydrogen, uh, or excuse me, those halogen acids. Um, and generally, we get better, uh, uh, better yields when we use these phosphorus halides than when we use um, the, high, the, out, the acids, the halogen acids. So um, here's an example where we have um, a primary alcohol here, right? So that, that um, where the hydroxyl group is on neopental alcohol, it's bonded to a carbon atom that's bonded to one other carbon atom, right? And we've seen this uh, species before, this neopental alcohol. So remember what, what's happened in the past when we've used a neopental group in a what we're trying to do a substitution reaction, um, we often get rearrangements because even though it's not particularly sterically hindered on that alpha carbon that's, that's bonded to the hydroxyl group because that's just a primary carbon, the carbon right next door is uh, quaternary, right? So it's that carbon that's bonded to four other carbons. So we said, we've said before when we were looking at substitution reactions that this has a lot of steric bulk on the beta carbon, which can prevent an SN2 mechanism from occurring. So sometimes 
particularly if we use HBr in this reaction, we're actually going to get a rearrangement to occur. And so we want to make this neopental bromide, but if we use HBr, it would not go through an SN2 mechanism. It would go through an SN1 mechanism with rearrangement. So using PBr3 instead on this substrate is actually going to prevent that uh, rearrangement from occurring, and we can do what we intuitively set out to do, which is replace that OH with the Br. Notice our, our product over there, the neopental bromide, the only difference is the OH, the hydroxyl group, has been replaced by a bromide. And so there was no rearrangement that occurred, and this went through an SN2 mechanism. Um, and similarly, we've got this uh, primary uh, alcohol down below, um, and we use phosphorus and iodine because we can't put in PI3, but we can put in P and I2, and they, uh, in the right stoichiometry, are going to combine to make PI3, and we'll be able to replace that hydroxyl group with an iodine. Um, and this isn't, doesn't just work for primary alcohols, it works for both primary and secondary alcohols. So we'll see down below the final reaction, we've got a secondary alcohol that we treat with PBr3, and that just replaces the hydroxyl with the bromine. And, um, and so we get a pretty high yield there. The mechanism for this is uh, very similar to the mechanism if we were using HBr. So we have uh, phosphorus tribromide, we have this PBr3, and we're, we're using that in place of HBr but if you recognize what's happening, it, it looks almost identical to the mechanism if we were to use HBr. Uh, that first arrow, the, the alone pair on the alcohol is attacking phosphorus, and that breaks a bond between one phosphorus, between the phosphorus and one of the bromides. If we just imagine that that group right there, that phosphorus, was the hydrogen instead, and it was HBr instead of this PBr, then the mechanism would be exactly the same. The alcohol would attack the H, the bond between the H and the Br would break, and uh, we would have turned that OH into a good leaving group by making it into a molecule of water. That's exactly what's happening here. Notice the, the structure that we're left with in the middle there after the first step. We have an oxygen with a positive charge, and it's bonded to that phosphorus with two bromines. Well, it, that phosphorus with two bromines makes that alcohol a weak base when it leaves, and it makes it a better leaving group, just like it would if it were an H. And notice how we displace, in the first step, we displace bromide, right? The bond between P and Br breaks, and so then we free one of those bromide ions to be Br minus, and bromide is a good nucleophile, so that nucleophile can then come and attack our electrophilic carbon and make the leaving group leave. So this mechanism really works the exact same way as HBr. We're just replacing the H with that phosphorus that has bonds to bromine instead. But otherwise, you can imagine that this mechanism is the same, and it's the same logic, which is that we turn OH into a better leaving group after it reacts with the uh, phosphorus tribromide, and then we release the bromide ion, which is a good nucleophile, just like we do when we react with HBr. So um, another strategy we can use to turn alcohols into, um, in this case, particularly alkyl chlorides, so this only works for alkyl chlorides, not iodides or bromides, is another reagent uh, called thionyl chloride, S-O-C-L-2. And so um, I'm just going to, uh, the, the mechanism that we just looked at for PBr3 is the same as it is for PCl3 and PI3. We can change the chloride and the bromide and the iodine on that phosphorus atom, and the mechanism is going to work the same. So we, we just looked at the mechanism for PBr3, but it's the same for PCl3 and PI3. They work the same way. We just change the halogen out. Um, this other reagent, thionyl chloride, is uh, specific for alkyl chlorides, and um, we also get really good yields from this reaction. Uh, and it's often easier for us to uh, separate our, the byproducts. So this mechanism works really well 
um, for us to purify our alkyl chloride when it's done. <coughs> um, be, namely because we make SO2. And SO2, that sulfur dioxide, is a gas. And so in the uh, course of this reaction, we add thionyl chloride, SOCl2, which is a liquid, and we'll add that to our reaction. But then uh, after the chlorine has been delivered to our substrate, the, the alcohol has been replaced by a chloride, one of our products is SO2, which just bubbles away. So as you may recall from the lab, often one of the most difficult parts of uh, performing a chemical reaction is when you're done, you have to work it up and you have to purify your material and try to get your desired product all by itself and very pure. Well, when one of your byproducts is a gas and it just bubbles out of the reaction, that saves you the trouble of having to purify. So that's why we use this thionyl chloride uh, because it, it's the workup is really easy. And our other byproduct there, notice, is HCl. And HCl is um, soluble in the aqueous layer when we do uh, an extraction in our separatory funnel. So the HCl would just stay in the, in the water and our product would be in the organic solvent layer. So this is a very easy reaction to work up and we get really high yields here. Um, notice on uh, the reaction below we start with a secondary alcohol and we um, use thionyl chloride and we get an 84 percent yield of our product. We replace the hydroxyl group with that chloride. Another thing that's interesting about this reaction is notice that the stereochemistry has not been inverted. So even though this is this does go through an SN2 mechanism, this is still a substitution mechanism, it occurs in such a way as to prevent the, that uh, stereocenter from being inverted like we would expect with a normal um, SN2 mechanism. We get 84 percent of our product and it has the same stereochemistry as our reactant. So uh, just to reiterate here, these are the strategies that we would use depending on the degree of substitution of our alcohol. So if we have a primary or secondary alcohol, we want to avoid using those halogen acids uh, to convert the alcohol to an alkyl halide. So we could use PBr3 um, or Pi3 for an iodide. We could even use PCl3 for a chloride. But often this thionyl chloride, the SOCl2, is a better reagent than the PCl3 or PCl5. So this table kind of shows us uh, the best reagents that we can use in order to um, perform the transformation we're looking for. When we're looking at tertiary alkyl halides, then we can use HCl, HBr, or HI as we would normally do because then we're not worried about rearrangements anymore. Uh, usually when we are using an acid, we go through an SN1 mechanism. HCl, HBr, and HI are going to go through an SN1 mechanism, which means that they're prone to rearrangement. But if we have a tertiary alcohol, then they're can't be any rearrangement because we'll make a tertiary carbocation, which is already as stable as it can get. So it's okay to use HCl, HBr, and HI on tertiary alcohols. It's just when they're primary or secondary, we want to use one of these other strategies so that we can prevent those rearrangements from occurring. Okay, um, we are going to look at how we can uh, convert alcohols to ethers now. And so um, alcohols are nucleophilic, and if we have a good electrophile, then we can use the nucleophilic part of the alcohol to attack some uh, substrate that has a good leaving group. In this case, it's, an, uh, it's another molecule of alcohol that's been protonated, and our alcohol is going to attack the electrophilic carbon on that protonated alcohol and the leaving group is water because we protonated one of those alcohols. So notice in this mechanism here, the nucleophile and the electrophile are actually the same molecule. It's just that the electrophile has been protonated, that alcohol has been protonated. So we add a catalytic amount of, uh, of acid, of H+. Generally, 
in the form of sulfuric acid if we want to avoid having um, like a bromide or a chloride or an iodide that can go on to react further after the um, addition of H plus, then we'll use H2SO4 when all we're looking for is H plus. Remember, I've, I've mentioned that before. Uh, in that case, when one of the molecules of alcohol becomes protonated, that makes uh, water uh, as our leaving group. So that makes that carbon atom particularly electrophilic because now it's attached to a good leaving group. So a molecule of alcohol that has not been protonated can attack a molecule of alcohol that has been protonated in an SN2 mechanism, and then we will have two carbons on either side of that oxygen, which is the, how we define an ether. So the mechanism here, uh, it doesn't show that first step where that electrophilic alcohol has been protonated. So we would we'd go back one step if we were drawing the whole mechanism here, and we'd show that the first step is the alcohol grabbing an H from H2SO4, from H3O+, becoming protonated. The second step, we have an unprotonated alcohol that's going to attack that protonated alcohol because now it has a good leaving group. And in the third step, we've made an ether that still has an extra proton on there because we need to remove that final proton from the alcohol in order to leave us with a neutral product at the end. So um, remember that's, that's pretty typical when we're looking at these reactions is that the mechanism is not finished until our product is neutral. And so the last step is deprotonating that ether and we'll be left with an oxygen that has a carbon on either side instead of a hydrogen. So we've converted our alcohol into an ether in this case. This is called bimolecular condensation because the alcohol, the starting material alcohol, is, is both halves of the reaction. It's both the nucleophile and the electrophile. We don't need two different reagents. We don't start with uh, uh, a good nucleophile and, and we have a different electrophile like an alkyl bromide or something. In this case, they're both the same molecule. The only difference is that one of them has been protonated so I add a catalytic amount of acid, and then the reaction can move forward, and uh, a condensation reaction is one where two molecules come together to make one molecule. So we start with two molecules of alcohol, and our product condenses them, brings them together, and makes one molecule of ether. So we call this kind of reaction a bimolecular condensation. So that's one way that we can make ethers with this bimolecular condensation, uh, which requires acid and heat. Another way that we can make alcohols, oh, I should mention that that bimolecular condensation, it always makes symmetric alcohols because both of our starting materials are the same, right? We have two molecules of ethanol, for example, that are reacting together. So that means the groups on either side of my ether are going to be ethyl groups. They have to be the same because they're both starting from the same molecule. So we always make symmetric ethers when, we under, when they undergo bimolecular condensation. But sometimes we don't want to make symmetric ethers. Sometimes we want the groups on either side of the oxygen to be different. We want a methyl on one side and an ethyl on one side, for example. We can't do that with bimolecular condensation or at least not without making a big mixture of products. Uh, so a better way to do that synthetically is through what's called the Williamson ether synthesis. So in Williamson ether synthesis, we take advantage of the fact that if we can deprotonate that alcohol and take the H off of the alcohol, we make an alkoxide. So we go from a neutral alcohol to a negatively charged oxygen anion and that negatively charged oxygen anion is a good nucleophile. So if we deprotonate an alcohol, then we turn it from a weak nucleophile into a strong nucleophile, right? The left side of these reactions, we have ROH, which is a neutral alcohol. And remember, uh, a, a good quick way for us to determine if a nucleophile is strong or weak is to look at the charge. So this molecule is neutral, ROH, but if we can pull that proton off and turn it into RO minus, then it becomes a strong nucleophile. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
There's a couple of ways that we can do this. In, in general, we have to add a base, right? Because if we add a base, then we can uh, react that acidic proton on the alcohol. We just have to be careful which kind of base we add. We don't want to add a base that's also a good nucleophile because a base that's also a good nucleophile could potentially react in a substitution manner or react as a nucleophile rather than as a base, which is not what we want here. In this case, all we want that base to attack is the uh, hydrogen on the alcohol. So we've looked at this a couple of times before where we've used solid metals as bases, essentially. It's actually more of a oxidation reduction reaction, um, but it serves the same purpose, which is to remove the H and leave us with an alkoxide. So sodium and potassium are good metals for this. Uh, notice how the sodium and potassium on the left side of the equation have no charge. That indicates that they're neutral metals, and when sodium and potassium are neutral, that means that they have an extra electron. So there's one electron on the sodium and potassium on the left side, and then on the right side, that uh, uh, electron has been reacted, the sodium and potassium have become oxidized, and the hydrogen has become reduced. So the hydrogen in this case uh, gets reduced, it, it accepts that electron from sodium and potassium, and it turns into hydrogen gas. So um, this is another example of us having a kind of uh, reaction set up where one of the products of the reaction is a gas, and the gas bubbles away which makes purification very easy. We don't have a big mixture of products because the, the H that we tried to remove, it literally bubbled out of the reaction and it left, and it went up into the atmosphere. So we could use sodium or potassium metal for this, and then in the end we'll have a sodium alkoxide or a potassium alkoxide, where the sodium and potassium just serve as the counter ions to the uh, negatively charged oxygen there or we could use a reagent called sodium hydride, and we've seen this before too. Um, we've seen several different hydride reagents so far. We've seen sodium borohydride, NaBH4, where the hydride is attached to the boron. We've seen lithium aluminum hydride, which LiAlH4, where those hydride are attached to an aluminum atom in the middle. Uh, and now we have this sodium hydride, where the hydride is literally an anion, and it's, the charge is balanced by the sodium on the other side. So um, the big difference here is that sodium hydride is actually a, a non-nucleophilic source of hydride. So the hydride in sodium hydride, it's just H-, and it's actually a really strong base, but it's not a particularly good nucleophile. When we've used sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride in reactions before, what we're actually trying to do in those reactions, remember, is to use the hydride as a nucleophile, and we actually are trying to have H- minus attack a carbon, and so we can deliver an H to a carbon as in a nucleophilic fashion. So if we want H-, minus, if we want a hydride to act as a nucleophile, we use sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. But if we're just looking for a base, then we can use sodium hydride, where the, hyd the hydride, the H, is not uh, uh, coordinated with any other metal, like boron or aluminum, and that's going to make it just a basic source of hydride. So in that case, the hydride base um, attacks the acidic proton on the alcohol, so we have H-, minus. And remember that the, the acidic proton on the alcohol is kind of like H+, plus. so H- minus and H+, plus react, and that makes hydrogen gas. So again, the hydrogen gas is going to bubble away, and we're left with a sodium alkoxide. So notice that there's not really a difference in terms of whether we use sodium metal or sodium hydride. In both cases, we end up with a sodium alkoxide and hydrogen gas. So the only difference is one of practicality in the lab. Um, sodium hydride is pretty reactive. It could uh, sometimes start on fire. It's, it's a powder, and as you're weighing it out, 
it can start to react with the water in the atmosphere and that could potentially make it start on fire. Um, but then again, sodium metal is pretty reactive too. Uh, maybe you recall from Gen Chem when you got to play with some sodium metal, as soon as it's in the atmosphere, it also begins reacting with the, uh, the oxygen and the water in the atmosphere. If you put it into water, if you put sodium into a, a protic solvent like water or even an alcohol, it's a pretty violent reaction. So in both cases, these are strong reagents. Um, but in terms of using them for synthesis problems, like we've said before, it doesn't really matter. If, you're, if you choose sodium metal or sodium hydride, you're going to get the same products. And so uh, on a test or in, in a lecture capacity, it's not important. We don't have to really consider practicality in the lab in that case. So first step in a Williamson ether synthesis is to remove the H, turn our alcohol from a weak nucleophile into a strong nucleophile. Once we have a strong nucleophile, then we add our electrophile. And remember, the best electrophiles for substitution reactions are alkyl halides because those halogens are really good leaving groups. If we have a bromide or an iodide as a leaving group, those are really good electrophiles. And so they're very easily attacked by a strong nucleophile. So we start with our alcohol, we remove the proton, and then we use the, al the resulting alkoxide ion to attack our electrophile, which uh, in this case is going to be uh, a halogen. We don't know what a tosylate is yet, but we'll look at tosylates in the next chapter and see how they're also good electrophilic reagents. They're also good leaving groups. So in this case, we'll just imagine that it's a bromide or an iodide. Uh, the alkoxide ion attacks the electrophilic uh, alkyl halide, and that gives us an ether, right? Because we have a carbon on one side that was from the original alcohol, the, the R in blue, and then we'll put a carbon on the other side, which comes from the alkoxide ion attacking our halogen and get the and then the leaving group leaves in an SN2 mechanism. So in this way we can form asymmetric ethers. So the R that's in blue is not necessarily the same group as the R that's in black. They could be the same. You could also make symmetric ethers this way, but they could be different. The blue R could be a methyl group and the black R could be an ethyl group, for example. So we'd make a methyl ethyl ether. We'd make asymmetric ethers, different carbon groups on each side. Uh, when we are choosing our which groups we want to put, so when we look, when we think about an ether, an ether has an oxygen in the middle and it has a carbon group on the left and a carbon group on the right. So theoretically, it doesn't matter which of those, the, the carbon group on the left or the carbon group on the right, starts as the alcohol. They could both potentially be the alcohol, and then the other half could be the alkyl halide, and vice versa. But when we think about practically about getting a high yield on this reaction, it really does matter. Our choice of which reagent is which really does matter. So in this case, we have this cyclopentyl uh, ani oxygen anion, cyclopentyl alkoxide, and that is going to be our nucleophile, and that's going to attack the, our alkyl halide, which in this case is ethyl bromide. There's two carbons and a bromine, so ethyl bromide. And so we have the, the big group here attacking the ethyl bromide to give us our ether on the right side. And notice that we've got that oxygen atom in the middle, and on the left we have a cyclopentyl group, and on the right we have an ethyl group. So if you imagine that we could have reversed these, instead of the oxygen being attached to the cyclopentane, we could have had the bromine attached to the cyclopentane. And instead of the bromine attached to the ethyl bromide, we could have had the oxygen attached to the ethyl to that side. We can basically swap those oxygen and bromine atoms, and the reaction would theoretically work the same way because we'd have O minus on one half, and we'd have a good leaving group, a, a bromine on the other half. But when you think about the requirements of an SN2 mechanism, remember we're always worried about being in competition with an elimination reaction. We have to remember that the best substrates for SN2 mechanisms are methyl or primary substrates.
as soon as we get to a secondary substrate, we're in competition with an elimination reaction, and an elimination reaction uh, is not going to potentially be what we're after in this case. So the way that this reaction is designed is the best way for this to work, where the, our nucleophile is secondary. Notice that alkoxide is secondary. The, ad, the carbon that's attached to the oxygen is also attached to two other carbons. It's a secondary reactant. And the uh, ethyl bromide is primary. So in this case, the primary, re the primary substrate is being attacked. That makes the SN2 reaction work particularly well. If we were to reverse the bromine and oxygen atoms, then we'd have a small nucleophile, which is good because the oxygen would be on that ethyl group, which is a small, strong nucleophile. But our alkyl bromide would be secondary. And if our alkyl bromide is secondary, then we might get some elimination byproduct in that case. So notice the, the question below says, why is the cyclopentyl group chosen for the alkoxide and the ethyl group chosen for the halide? Theoretically, we could swap them. However, in practice, we always want the alkyl halide, when we're doing this ether synthesis, should be as, as have the lowest substitution possible. So either methyl or primary. As soon as we start getting into secondary, we have some substitution and some elimination. And as soon as we get to a tertiary substrate, we won't have substitution at all. It will just be a completely an elimination reaction at that point. So we would not be able to make an ether. We would make an alkene. Right? We would make a double bond from an elimination reaction. So if we're setting out to make an ether, our alkyl halide must be have the lowest substitution possible. So now we've seen how to make alcohols into ethers by molecular condensation and the Williamson ether synthesis. Um, we can also make alcohols into esters, and that requires an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. So recognize in this scheme that's uh, shown here, we have um, the alcohol and the acid coming together. It's kind of like a condensation. Remember when we had our uh, bimolecular condensation um, and we brought two molecules of acid together, one had been protonated, and we brought them together and they condensed into one molecule, an ether. Well, this is really just kind of like uh, a bimolecular condensation that makes esters. It's really the same mechanism. It's very similar. So we need catalytic acid, just like we did with the bimolecular condensation. So in this case, the carbonyl gets protonated, and then uh, the alcohol can attack the carbonyl, and eventually we turn that OH. See that the OH is circled on the acid? that OH becomes protonated and turns into a good leaving group. It turns into water. Um, so recognize that the alcohol on the left is green. It has a green ROH. And the ester on the right has the green RO. But the, the carboxylic acid that we started with on the left, it also had an oxygen. So what's important to recognize here is that the oxygen that's in the ester actually came from the alcohol. And the, the oxygen that was in the carboxylic acid originally became part of the leaving group. Pay careful attention to the colors here. So the alcohol ROH, that H was added to the OH from the carboxylic acid, thereby turning it into a molecule of water and making it a good leaving group. But the oxygen, the oxygen that was on the alcohol became part of the ester. That's why it's, that's why it's green on the right side there. So let's look at this mechanism and see how this works. So before we take a look at the mechanism, we're going to see that we can do this with esters. Uh, we can make esters with carboxylic acids, and we can make esters with acid chlorides. And so remember in the last chapter, we were talking about um, the difference between carbonyl functional groups that have bad leaving groups, like ketones and aldehydes, and carbonyls that have good leaving groups, like esters or carboxylic acids or acid chlorides. So that's what we're showing here too, is that we don't have to start with the carboxylic acid on the previous slide. When we do that, the carboxylic acid on the previous slide uh, starts with an OH leaving group, and we protonate it to turn it into H2O, so it becomes a good leaving group. When we start with an acid chloride, 
we have a chlorine atom that's already a good leaving group because it's going to leave as a weak base. And so when we use an alcohol and an acid chloride, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that that chlorine is a good leaving group. And when we attack the carbonyl um, and we make that tetrahedral intermediate, that we, as we saw before, when the carbonyl reforms, it's going to kick out the chlorine because the chlorine is a good leaving group. Um, and so it does, we can make esters starting from carboxylic acids and alcohols, or we can start from acid chlorides and alcohols. Another thing to recognize about the difference between these two pathways is that when we use a carboxylic acid, it requires catalytic acid. But when we use an acid chloride, we use pyridine, which is a base. So we mentioned this before last week when we were saying that it often helps to have two different ways to do the same transformation, one which needs acid and a different way which needs base because sometimes our functional groups are sensitive to acid or base. And so it helps for us to have two different ways to do the same reaction. So I actually misspoke where uh, the mechanisms aren't covered in this chapter for those esterifications, making those esters. Those mechanisms aren't covered until um, chapter 21, and we'll get to that next term. And so at this point, um, you'll just be responsible for understanding the transformation, uh, how we can turn alcohols into esters by reacting them with either acid chlorides or carboxylic acids, as we showed on the last two slides. So here in summary, we'll see that these are uh, some of the reactions that we've looked at where we cleave the OH bond. So this table in particular um, goes over the reactions where we cleave the OH bond. So notice how we can use sodium or potassium as our uh, bases to cleave that H bond. We could use sodium hydride. Um, we could even potentially use sodium hydroxide, although one of the issues with using hydroxide as a base is that it's also a good nucleophile. And so sometimes it can react with our substrate in uh, a way that we don't intend. So we can deprotonate the alcohol with some base, like sodium or potassium metal, which gives us an alkoxide. And we can use that alkoxide as a strong nucleophile to make an ether, this Williamson ether synthesis, where we just need a good uh, electrophile, like an alkyl halide. We can remove the H and replace it with a tosyl group by using tosyl chloride and pyridine. That makes it a better leaving group. And we can also oxidize uh, secondary alcohols into ketones using any of the oxidizing agents we talked about. Or we can oxidize primary alcohols into carboxylic acids or aldehydes, depending on the conditions. And remember, the, the major um, component of the, the difference between these two pathways is that when we use water in our reagents, we often end up with a carboxylic acid. But if we don't have any water in our reaction, then we will stop at the aldehyde. And here is the last summary page, and this summary page is the reaction of alcohols where we cleave the carbon-oxygen bond. So we're reacting the alcohol as an electrophile instead of as a nucleophile. So in this case, um, we saw that we can react with uh, halogen acids and make that OH into an H2O and make it into a good leaving group. We can use um, uh, phosphorus hal halides like PBR3 or PCL3 or PI3 um, in order to make um, alkyl halides, generally from primary and secondary alcohols. And remember, if we're using tertiary alcohols, we usually uh, would use the hydrogen or the halogen acids. And finally, if we uh, turn the OH into a good leaving group with H2SO4 and we heat it up, then we can promote an elimination reaction where uh, we, water becomes the base and it removes a beta hydrogen, and we have an E1 type elimination reaction. So we generally get the Zaitsev product from this reaction.